What's going on, everyone? Welcome to the Backstage Journal podcast. My name is Rhett. Thank you for checking out this episode. We are well into season three now, and I'm really excited about today's guest. This is somebody I've wanted to have on uh, my podcast for a long time. He's a, a local Atlantan and the front man for uh, a hell of a Southern rock band called Blackberry Smoke. His name is Charlie Starr. A lot of you probably already know Charlie and, and are familiar with his work. He's one of uh, the, the best guitar playing, singing, writing front men of, of any band around today. And uh, you couldn't ask for a nicer human being. Um, just had a great conversation with Charlie that I'm really excited to share with you. We talk all things songwriting and, and you know, uh, guitar and influences and things like that. He and I have a very similar, I think, uh, musical lineage, I guess you could say in terms of who we love and, and listen to and, and the style of guitar that we love to play and, and all that kind of stuff. It, it's awesome. It's a really great interview. I'm excited to share with you. But before we get to that, as is tradition around here, we're going to take a voicemail question from one of you guys, the listeners. Uh, if you want to leave a voicemail for next week's episode, you can call the Google Voice number 470-222-5851. And uh, we're going to jump into this week's question. Hey, Rhett. Uh, I got a question for you. Uh, a while back, I believe it was on a live stream, you were talking about Noah and how he's an acoustic guitar player uh, who plays electric guitar like an acoustic player. Um, I wanted to know more about your thoughts on what makes an uh, electric guitar player an electric guitar player versus an acoustic player playing electric guitar. Uh, thanks for all the great content. Looking forward to uh, seeing it soon. All right. Thanks. Bye. Great, great question. Um, yeah, and I have said that about Noah, and I hope I hope you understand that is in no way like a dig or anything like that. That's not to say that Noah's not a great electric player or anything. Noah is actually one of the the best acoustic guitar players that I personally know. He's fantastic at playing acoustic, but he spends most of his time playing acoustic guitar, and hasn't spent a lot of time on electric guitar. And they are they are two I think different. Uh, instruments with with two different approaches and what i mean in terms of noah is the way he physically plays the guitar the way he strums and the type of rhythms and and chords and things that he plays are essentially very similar to the things that he would play on his acoustic guitar which again there's nothing wrong with that um but i think um what makes uh, an electric player to answer your question i think it really comes down to the best way I could put it is maybe laying back a little bit and letting the guitar and the amp and any effects that you might be running at the time, letting that stuff kind of do the work. You just approach it differently. With an acoustic guitar, oftentimes, especially when it's a singer, songwriter playing, they're trying to fill up space. You think about someone like Noah, a lot of times when he's writing, he's writing with just himself, his voice, and the acoustic guitar. And a lot of times when he's performing, it's just himself with his guitar. So he needs to fill up a lot of the sonic spectrum with his guitar. When you're playing electric in the context of a band, when, for instance, when I'm playing with Noah, I'm trying to accomplish a completely different thing. I'm not trying to fill up as much space as possible and to take over the rhythm and, and driving the tempo of the song and the feel of the song. I'm sitting in with the other elements of the band and adding my sort of layer on on top of things. So oftentimes that means I'm playing less. That means I'm not playing as much heavy rhythm. I mean, depending on what the song calls for, um, I may be playing more single note lines or or you know outlining chords through a progression. Oftentimes Noah will be playing the the rhythm acoustic or electric, so the song doesn't call for me to play the same thing. The song might call for me to take a you know a six four one five and outline those chords in a higher register of the neck only maybe on three strings or maybe i'm playing like a sixth voicing up the neck or, or anything like that um, or maybe i'm not playing at all and i'm playing in between the vocals things like that it's just a completely different approach um, if you are an acoustic guitar player and someone that's trying to get into electric i think it's beneficial to think about that your mindset should be slightly different when you're playing an electric versus when you're playing you know, accompanying yourself on an acoustic guitar, for example. And and again, I don't want to be overly simplistic here and say there's only one way to play an acoustic or only one way to play an electric. That's not at all what I'm saying. Um, I just think 
the, the, the two instruments are different and they require a different approach. So anyways, hope that answers your question. Thanks so much for leaving the voicemail. You didn't leave your name, but thank you nonetheless. If you want to leave a voicemail for next week's episode, that's 470-222-5851. All right. With the intro out of the way, let's jump into the interview with Charlie. Um, this is a Southern Rock guitar nerd's delight. At least that's how I felt about it. So uh, anyways, without further ado, here's Charlie Starr. So yeah, man, thanks for thanks for jumping on. I've been wanting to do this for a while, and uh, pandemic being what it is, I decided to kind of take take some time away from the podcast, restructure it, and bring it back, and and here we are. So thanks for for jumping on, dude. Yo, thanks for having me. How have uh, how have things been going for you in the last year? Well, it's been an interesting year. Um, not the best year, which I guess is par for the course, but um, it's been productive, uh, more productive than I thought it would be. You know, our focus was shifted on making a record and actually wound up making a couple of different records with different people and uh, wrote a lot of songs. Yeah. And actually pl- pl- played some shows, some socially distanced kind of things that were, they were odd, but better right. than nothing. Right. Full band stuff with, with Blackberry Smoke? Yeah. The uh, full band stuff and then solo acoustic stuff too and uh, some full band acoustic things and mm-hmm. I have a very interesting story about one of them, but I'll oh, really, you may, you may ask the question. So I'll wait. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, <laughs> we'll get rolling here before we jump into the, the crazy road stories. But, um, well, that's cool, man. It seems like a lot of people have sort of taken that route in the last year of going to, you know, I, I think there's going to be a lot of albums and EPs that drop this year that were, uh, were birthed in 2020, you know, I think you're right. I think a lot of them are, have already come out and, uh, yeah. I got one buddy who his band released a record back in June and he's like, well, I guess we'll make another one. <laughs> Nothing else to do. Yeah. Now you can, now you can tour on two records, right? You got options, you know, for a set list, you can do, you know, either one. So what's your, uh, what's your writing process? Like, do you, uh, for, for Blackberry smoke and for, for any, you know, original stuff on your own, is it, is it mostly you or is it a collaborative effort with the band? What does that look like? It's mostly always been me. Um, and then I've got, um, a few friends that I've made over the years. I started writing songs, uh, with other people in Nashville a long time ago, not on a regular basis. Cause that's a little, uh, I was never really comfortable with that entirely because especially walking into a room with somebody you don't know, you know, right. you like, punch the clock and start. And it's like, what are we going to write about? I don't know. I don't know you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but I made some friends, um, and we still, uh, well initially when I did that and we still write to this day. So, uh, but, but now I know them. <laughs> so writing for you seems like kind of a, a, a sort of personal process, would you say? It can be. Um, uh, and I don't know if I ever really turn a, switch on or off when it comes to that, you know, I think it, uh, whatever decides to, to flow out that day, it might be something really personal or it might just be silly, you know? (laughs) Mm, Right. Right. I'm fascinated by this because, um, coming from, you know, a a guitar player, hired gun background, I've always worked with great songwriters and singers, but I'm now sort of stepping into the writing side of things now at thanks to 2020 and, I, I think like a lot of the people that listen to this show and watch the show are, uh, I kind of don't know what the hell I'm doing. <laughs> so kind of how a... long, have, how long have you been writing? Like when did, when did all that start, uh, that stuff start for you? Uh, I started writing in earnest in my, uh, mid to late twenties. Um, and before that I always played with songwriters, like you said. Yeah. Um, and I was always uh, really interested in their craft, you know, and I'd spent all of my, uh, my youth, you know, playing in cover bands and playing in bars and, um, uh, and playing great songs, you know, and, uh, I don't know, I guess that that's a, a good way to get ready. Um, but I, I remember I played with a songwriter named Chris Edmonds from Atlanta for a few years and I love and respect him so much. And he would come in with these incredible songs, you know, and it would just, it would blow me away. I'd be like, wow, when did you write that yesterday? 
you know, like what, how, um, but I started to kind of get inside those songs and think, okay, well, this is not, um, uh, you know, he wasn't writing prog songs. Mm-hmm. They were just good rock songs. And, uh, I think it was just very inspiring really. So was there a moment for you that, that you can point to as a young, you know, 20 something guitar player where you figured out like, you know what, I think writing might be something I want to put more effort into, or was it something that was always at the back of your mind being a guitar player that you just sort of grew into over time? Um, I think it just grew into it. You know, it, it, I wrote some ridiculously bad songs when I was a teenager, you know, to get those, uh, get some of those out of the way. (laughs) Yeah. And I think it just took a while for, um, for me to write something that I was, uh, not ashamed of that I could take to rehearsal and go, Hey guys, check this out. Mm. You know? And, uh, I was just talking to somebody about this the other day that when you get excited about something, you know, that you've written, if somebody else is excited about it, then it triples. You're like, Oh, okay. Maybe it is good. You know? Yeah. Right. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's what a weird process. Yeah. Yeah, I'm 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 just kind of on the edge of it. I've always been on the edge looking on the inside and now starting to try and get into it. It's it's can be somewhat intimidating sometimes. And I think like just about anything creative, it seems to be that there's a there's a learning like a grace period where you kind of have to learn your preferred workflow because everybody I think writes differently, wouldn't you say? I would say so. Um yeah, I've I've um, worked with some writers that are really, really fast. And I'm just, I remember thinking, do you have that just rattling around in your brain? You know, these, these, uh, ideas and these, uh, you know, one, one thing about writing songs is it's almost like all the songs have been written. Sometimes you're like, mm. Oh God, well, that's, been said or that's been played or, and it's our job to kind of find a diff, little bit different way to sing it, say it, or play it. And, yeah. uh, and some guys uh, have just really been, I'm like, I don't think that way. If I did, it would take a minute, you know, not right. just right here at the, at the snap of your fingers. Um, I don't, Man. I don't get in a hurry myself. I don't, I don't think if a good song's in there, it doesn't have to appear right now mm. in this sitting, you know? Right. I don't get bummed out if I have to walk away for a couple of days. So you might you might do a thing where you put down a chord progression or maybe even build a, a track or something like that, and you don't have the full idea fleshed out, so you'll set it down and walk away and come back to it then. Yeah, and a lot of times that's good editing time where you walk in and go, that's not good the next day, <laughs> you know, or not as good as I thought it was. <laughs> right. It's, a, it's weird when you put fresh ears on something. Like you, you come in and you're like, you leave the, the room or whatever. You're like, all right, yeah, I feel pretty good about that. And you come back the next day and you listen to, or in my case, with video stuff, watching something. It's like, oh, Jesus, why did I think that worked? I got to reshoot that whole, right. <laughs> that yeah. whole segment. <laughs> yeah, man. So, so you said, you know, you grew up uh, playing in, in cover bands and stuff like that. When did, so take me back to like early guitar for you, because you are, you're, you're one of those people that I, I really admire in that not only are you a great writer and vocalist and front man, you're a hell of a guitar player. Anyone can watch you play and, and it's evident that you've spent the time and you've done your homework and you've, you know, the lineage and you know, the sounds that you're, you're going for and, and pulling off, like, you know, where that stuff came from. So what was early guitar playing life like for you? Well, thank you. First of all, um, well, when I was about six years old, uh, my dad was a, he's a bluegrass lover and a, he's a, a Martin D 28 lover. And he, he, he only really loves that music. And, uh, since I was a, a child and so he was always playing those songs around the house and singing. And, uh, I don't remember him not doing that. So that was the first, he was my first guitar hero. And, uh, so pretty quickly I started banging his guitar around, you know, when I was five or six and he's like, well, I'm going to get you one of your own. So you don't destroy mine. (laughs) Don't touch daddy's D 28. (laughs) But I wanted to know how to do that. It was such a troubadour thing to me to watch him do that. It was fascinating. Like, Oh, look at him. You know, he's, he's creating music. And so he taught me G C and D and, uh, and I was happy with that for a while. Uh, and then I realized as I got a little older, I'm like, none of my friends like Bill Monroe. Mm. Uh, 
they don't know who he is. They like Led Zeppelin and Black Sabbath and Aerosmith. And, and uh, so I wanted an, an electric guitar. Um, and, you know, did you have those? I don't know if you did. I had a group of, there was three or four of us that everybody got a guitar. And you learn the first things that, in my case, it was Iron Man and War Pigs and uh, pretty much every Zeppelin riff. Man, um, I, I, uh, I had one friend. He lived across the street from me, and he was a year older, and he got a guitar first, and that was my first kind of inclination. Nobody in my family played music. I never even, like, really saw a guitar or anything until I was, you know, 12 or 13 when my friend across the street got one and that was what piqued my interest but when i was in high school in like 04 to 08 i uh nobody played guitar like it wasn't a thing really and yeah. I, it was nothing that my friends did it was like this sort of solo venture that i was kind of trying to figure out on my own so it seems like you you had like a pretty good advantage there like just being able to network with your friends and kind of bounce ideas off of each other and stuff it was really it was really uh I look back fondly on it. It was just such an eye-opening time. I didn't have I didn't have an amplifier to begin with. I bought an electric guitar. It was a Mosrite copy, and it was striped up like Eddie Van Halen's guitar, who I loved, but couldn't play. Can't play that way. But we all loved Ed Edward, right. you know. Right. Uh, so the guy who sold me the guitar for twenty five bucks, his name was Bubba Bubba Lewis. He said, "Here's what you do." I was like, well, I don't have an amp. And he's like, no, go to your, you got a stereo, right? I said, yeah, my sister's got a great stereo, you know, the tall in the box, yep. uh, uh, phono receiver tape deck. Right. He said, uh, take this curly guitar cable that I'm supplying you with, plug it into the headphone jack, put a blank cassette in the recording side of the tape deck, hit, hit play, record, and pause, and turn the volume all the way up. And I did it, and it was like, oh, that's sound." Uh, it sounded horrible, but it was a sound, you know, it was really distorted. And I'm like, I can play war pigs on this. This is perfect. That's badass, man. I, yeah, that yeah. is uh that was not a thing when I started playing guitar. So that's, yeah. What was the idea behind play record and pause? Was it just to like get signal flowing through the tape heads and then coming back out? I think so. Yeah. Um, genius. But I wow. did, my sister, unfortunately the stereo was in her room. And she's four years older than I am. So I was 11 and she was 15, you know, so yeah. she's like, get out of my room. What are you doing in here? <laughs> oh, it's crazy. So when did you start playing in bands and stuff? Was it, uh, you know, late teens, early twenties, something like that? Yeah. Well, 15 or 16, um, the first, you know, high school band, we didn't have a singer. Nobody was brave enough to sing. And, uh, if anybody could, they wouldn't admit it that they, right. you know, and at that time, you know, the biggest bands in the world were, Guns N' Roses, Def Leppard, The Cult. Um, you know, there was a lot of that. Well, Guns N' Roses had come along and made all the ha all the hairspray and and makeup bands look silly mm. because they came in and, and they shower and they were dangerous, you know. And right. I remember just being like, ah, oh, this is real, you know, and I want to less Paul now because Slash is, you know, he changed the game. At yeah. The 87, 88. Um so we we were playing those songs with no singer. Um, and then the Black Crows, fast forward a couple of years, uh, that really hit home because they were so close to home. Mm. About 90, 90, I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then, uh, I don't know, but cover bands that I joined at, you know, when I got toward the end of high school, it was always older guys, older than me. And uh, we did, you know, Roadhouse Blues and uh, Foxy Lady and... yeah. You know, that's what people wanted to dance to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, man. Sure I we remember, did Mustang. Yeah. The, the, so the, the early Black Crow stuff. So you, you grew up like outside of Atlanta, whereabouts roughly? It's in Lynette, Alabama, which is just south of LaGrange, Georgia. But yeah. Okay. Just across the Alabama line, about 85 miles south of Atlanta. Yeah. My wife lived in Wetumpka for a little bit and, yeah. and I lived in Mobile for a little bit when I was a kid before moving here. So yeah fond memories of Alabama. So like, and, and, you know, the black crows, I guess, yeah, you, that would have been 1990. That was the record. Um, Brendan O'Brien did that first record, yeah. right? Yeah. Shake your money maker. Dude, the guitar sounds on that record. I actually just was referencing it. I did a video on open G the other day and, and was referencing that, pulled it back up. And was like, my God, man, some of the best guitar tones yeah. ever on that stuff, man. He's a magician, man. I mean, 
uh, people talk about, about you know the Pearl Jam records and the Stone Temple Pilots records and the Soundgarden records, all those that he made. But I think maybe some people miss those early '90s records that the Black Crows and Izzy Stradlin and the Four Horsemen and Raging Slab. And I mean, he was uh, he was the go-to guy if you wanted that really raw thing. He was the king. Yeah, man, that's that's interesting. So. On the songwriting front, so you're playing in, in bands, you're learning all these great songs. I mean, these legendary songs by by people. I mean, Jimmy Page, obviously, not just one of the most iconic guitar players of all time, but arguably, from a writing and like orchestration standpoint, is kind of in a league unto his own as, as far as guitar players go. Yeah. So how do you think that informed your writing today you know learning all these songs and, and the progressions and the parts that that went over the progressions how, how how has that affected you to this day i think it uh in a huge way um like you said i mean jimmy page is such an architect um if he were only a guitar player we wouldn't be talking about him nearly as much because you know there were people who were obviously technically better as far as you know ripping out a solo but those guys you know it's like I, just just for example, the rain song. The guy who wrote that is the champion <laughs> of the acoustic <laughs> yes. guitar. I mean, it's just an opus. But but not only that. I mean, he just his he produced all those Zeppelin records. You know, they would mm -hmm. choose a different engineer each time, and like rumor has it, so nobody could ever claim the Zeppelin sound. You know, right? It, it was all Jimmy. I mean, it's just it boggles my mind to put those records on and think. Think about how young he was. Yeah. Just just for example, when they recorded the second Zeppelin record, he was probably, what, 24 years old? Had to have been, yeah. And it just, it will never not sell. It's just too damn good. It's one of those bands that every generation, henceforth and forevermore, will discover Zeppelin. No matter how popular, like guitar or classic rock or blues or any of that stuff is, there will always be a segment of every generation of people that find Zeppelin and, and, you know, the Beatles and, and all kinds of stuff from, from that time period, but specifically yeah. them, because, you know, and it, it took me a while to get to Zeppelin, to be honest. Um, I think because it was so different than the, a lot of the stuff I grew up listening to that once I finally got it like 16 or 17, I finally got it. And it was just like, Holy shit, man. Yeah. <laughs> these, these guys, now what are they doing? It's in you forever. I just was talking to a friend the other day, uh, talking about songwriting specifically and about, uh, he brought, he pointed out and I never noticed it that stairway to heaven does not have a chorus. Mm -hmm. No chorus, yeah. no, none nope. needed. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh my so God. I was like, well, what the hell are we doing? Why am, why am I worried about a chorus from now on then? <laughs> <laughs> the only other song I can think of, think of off the top of my head that doesn't have a chorus that was popular was um uh black keys song uh off of uh the brothers record 2010 it was the yeah. single off of that song it um i love that record dude i do too um oh god why am i spacing on the name anyway the big single off of that record doesn't have a chorus doesn't go to the chorus the whole time and it was huge massively successful well so that that begs the question what the hell are we doing trying to write choruses you don't need it yeah well uh the uh um nine inch nails what's the one song head like a hole it has two choruses so there there you go yeah there are no rules charlie that's right yeah <laughs> man that's that's awesome so i'm i'm fascinated by this this process with with the songwriting stuff coming from like a guitar playing background um now now take me to to the days of early like blackberry smoke how did how did that band come together and and you know you guys have been around for a long time you've put out some amazing records um truly i think one of the great southern rock bands of the last you know 25 30 years so how did that all start oh thank you man um well it started brit turner and his brother richard turner bass player and drummer uh and myself we were uh, the band behind a singer songwriter in Atlanta named Gary Steer. And, uh, Gary was really, um, I loved him. Great dude. Great songs. But, uh, he, it was, it was very 
specific in his mind. He's like, I'm a songwriter and you guys are my backup band, mm. which we were okay. I'm like, okay, okay, well, we like these songs and we like you, so we'll go play them. So we went and made a record for Universal in New York um, and came home and never really toured and it just didn't take off. And, um, and we wound up not being able to get along with him well. Mm. Uh, because of what I mentioned before, and we wanted to be a band, you know, we didn't want to be some guy's backup band. Right. But anyway, we split from him and, uh, and I had had, I had really started to write songs on the side at that point, um, uh, in a serious way to, to myself, I, I was, I was starting to get serious about it and I would show them to him, to Gary, because I respected him a lot. He's a great songwriter and, um, uh, not to, you know, throw him under the bus, but he, he didn't seem interested in, in, in them. So I was like, okay, well, I'll, they're not for you then, you know? Uh, so when we split, I said to Britt and Richard, I said, I've got these songs written. Do you want, do you want to play them? And they said, sure. So we had one rehearsal, the, the new lineup and it felt really good, but it also felt immediately like we needed another guitar player. Yeah. Uh, we, uh, no good at being a power trio which the, the songs didn't lend themselves to that anyway. And uh, the first few songs were, we recorded on the first record, uh, Sanctified Woman and one called Testify and one called Normal Town. But I, I call, I remembered my old buddy, Paul Jackson from down in LaGrange, Georgia in the bar days, he had a cover band with his brother and we were like rival cover bands. And uh, they were a lot prettier than we were, <laughs> my, my old band. And uh, they played like songs that were guaranteed to put, people on the dance floor, like hot child in the city and stuff like that. Yeah. While we were playing like walking the dog by Aerosmith, we were cool, <laughs> you know, but I remembered that Paul played great guitar and that he had a beautifully high harmony voice, like incredibly high, like singing high B all the time. Yeah. So I called him and said, Hey, we we're forming this new band, myself and Britt and Richard from, from our old band, do you want to be in it? And he's like, sure. So he drove up and, and, uh, there was no internet then that I could be like, I'll send you the songs, you know, yeah. it's like, come on up and let's jam. So we jammed and he, it was a great fit immediately. And that was it. That's it, man, man, that, that's, that is awesome. And and how many records have you guys done together now? Seven, uh, yeah. seven studio records, a couple of live records, a bunch of EPs. We had a, we had a, weird window of time a couple of times between projects where shopping a record took forever. The business got in the way. Mm. And I remember thinking we could have made three records by now. Yeah. We're waiting to make another one, you know? So yeah. Anyway, that's a whole nother can of worms. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, lyrically, w were lyrics always important to you? coming up musically like playing in these bands form blackberry smoke you know you're starting to write stuff did it feel like a natural progression to you when you're starting to write because it's one thing to you know put a great chord progression together and maybe do kind of an instrumental thing but it's another thing to put lyrics and a vocal melody on top of it so were lyrics something that you always like paid attention to and and it was part of the listening process or did it sort of come later no it was always important um i never was into like what uh, what we were talking about earlier about like eighties bands where a lot of the, those songs were just garbage lyrically, mm. you know, but I wasn't really coming from that place. I was coming from way back with my dad, all those old folk songs and hillbilly string band songs that were all stories. Yeah. And, and country songs, even, you know, traditional Hank Williams songs. And, but then I really got into, to those kind of songwriters, those uh, will post that period, but Towns Van Zandt and Billy Joe Shaver and, and, uh, even Willie Nelson and all these great country singers. And then Steve Earle, who yeah. still is one of my favorite storytellers. And I mean, he's not even, you can't call him a country guy, really. He's a, just a Texas guy and he's, he can make a rock and roll record or a bluegrass record or, but he's like Texas's answer to Springsteen. Yeah. And that at the same time, so many moving parts, but my mom, she loved rock and roll. She loved the Stones and Bob Dylan and the Beatles. And how do you get better lyrically than those three entities? Right. Always, that's, always important. Yeah. That's something that, that I think is, it was lost on me for a long time. And, and I think it was just a maturity thing. Um, 
but what what initially turned me on to to finally realizing that the lyrics were important and it wasn't just like about the band and the guitar solos and all that kind of stuff was listening to Dawes, Taylor Goldsmith, yeah, and Jason Isbell. Like those yeah. two writers in particular really opened me up to the the power and the importance of the lyric and the vocal melody to the point now where I've like retroactively gone back and listened to a lot of the stuff of the records that I grew up listening to and kind of peeled back and discovered another layer that makes me appreciate them even more than I originally did. Absolutely. I, I, that's great artists, man. Yeah. Mind blowing, especially, especially Isbel. He is, uh, he is a gifted, gifted lyricist. <laughs> I, I can and will spend the rest of this the podcast uh, fangirling over over Jason. Uh, the whole band, Jason Isbell and the 400 Units. Sadler yeah. Vaden is one of like the baddest guitar players out there today, man. And man. I really love, like you can tell, there's just this... Um... Well, actually, this this kind of leads me to an interesting point. So you, you came up, you know in atlanta blackberry smoke is is i would say an atlanta band right it, there's something about this part of the country musically um that's and particularly what i mean is like upstate south carolina through atlanta down into like lower alabama kind of area the the artists and the bands that have come out of this sort of stretch of the southeast over the last i mean well hell 50 years where do you think that comes from in your experience? Because to me, it's kind of a unique sort of sound that happens here um, that is unique to here. Um, I don't know if I can answer that. Um, it's it's an age old question. Um, I think rock and roll um, is obviously Southern. I mean, it was born basically in the Southeastern United States, you know. Um, from the blues. So, yeah. yeah. So coming from blues and that and, and country music and gospel and not saying they weren't singing gospel music in, in New York, but um, it's all just such a, such an intrinsically Southern thing anyway. And I remember as a little kid, I would hear the stones and I hear Mick Jagger, you know, drawling out these songs, honky tonk women and jumping Jack flash. And I remember when I found out when I was old enough to realize that he was British, I, I remember asking my mom or, or mentioning, how does he sing like he's from Alabama, but he's from England and it's him putting it, he's putting it on, you know, he's affecting it that way because that's what it calls for. So I think that it's because I am answering the question, Rhett. Yeah, it's, you're, you're uh, doing great. <laughs> it's because all that stuff was born, that sound and that feel and that vibe. And I mean, think about little Richard and his fire and how he just sang with so much abandon and that was making Georgia through and through. So, and, and everybody, and you know, and then British guys try and sing that way. <laughs> yeah. So the answer is because, because it's Southern. That's why. Yeah. It, it's such a fast, I'm, I'm just really interested in that, that thing. And, and even today, like Marcus King band. Yeah. Dudes oh, are from, God. from Greenville, South Carolina. It's like, what the hell is in the water in Greenville, yeah. South Carolina? Like all those dudes came from, from yeah. Greenville and Greer and around there, you know? Um, and, and even like one of my best friends I've played with for years, Noah Guthrie, one of the best songwriters and singers I know, dude's like 25 years old and, and has a long career ahead of him. He's from Greer. It's like, there's something just in that small town, Southern United States thing that births these sounds that are iconic, man. They yeah. just last forever. I think Bono said that it's, uh, that the best music is created near a river. Uh, and he was talking about you know, being near the Chattahoochee. Uh, there's a river apparently that runs through Liverpool. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's in, it's in the mud. It's in the water, man. <laughs> so, just the Mississippi, that's, of course. That's awesome, dude. So um, I want to talk gear for a second. I see that beautiful uh, SG Junior behind you. Oh, yeah. That's uh so so take me through you know sounds you mentioned hearing slash and wanting a Les Paul what what's your like if you could describe your sound in terms of a guitar amp kind of thing what is what is that to you oh I don't know if I could describe it um uh, I would have predominantly been a Gibson guy 
since I was a teenager. Um, and that's Jimmy, that's Jimmy Page and Slash and Joe Perry's fault, really. Um, I didn't, you know, I had buddies that went for the strap because of Hendrix, but I didn't. I went the Gibson route. But I tell you what, man, I had a I had a an oh shit moment in 1993. I had just moved to Atlanta and I went to see the Hellhounds at Smith's Old Bar. And the Hellhounds were basically the Georgia Satellites without Dan Baird, the lead singer. Mm-hmm. But, but I'm standing there and Rick Richards walks out onto that little stage with the Les Paul Jr. And he was playing a high watt half stack and he hit a G chord full volume and my life was changed forever. I thought, all right, like instantly my ears understood, okay, that is a really great combination. Like this big amp, this big tube amp and that P90 guitar. Mm. And I just couldn't stop talking about it. It just, it affected me just in such a deep way. And, uh, I, I met a guy named Ted Lathang who was working at Clark music on Ponce. And I went in one day and he was there too. And he saw, I think the, the big hearts in my eyes, maybe, you know? <laughs> and he said, I've got one of Rick's old guitars here on consignment. You should buy it. It's this refinished one, a black one, right? Black 56 junior. And, uh, I actually wound up, I traded him a bunch of stuff and a little bit of cash. I couldn't afford to buy the guitar outright, but, but I got it and still have it still play it every show. But that was, and I love other guitars too. I love humbuckers and I love, I love single coil pickups, but man, P nineties are my favorite. I agree. I think they're the best pickup. Um, I think they're the most well-rounded. If you're going to have a, a one pickup, especially a single pickup guitar to do everything. I think in my mind, it's a P90 because you can do both things, right? You, you, you roll off the volume a little bit, you pick a little closer to the bridge and you've got that sort of telly bridge pickup or strap pickup bridge kind of thing. And you bring it up a little bit, you pick a little bit closer to the neck and dig in a little harder in your in PAF territory because the PAF came from the, the P90. I mean, there's a direct connection yeah. between the two, you know? Exactly. Yeah. I, I think, you know, at some point, I mean, we all talk about Leslie West and what a huge uh, influence he was on rock and roll guitar players. And I guess maybe I, I guess I knew that he played a junior, uh, but it wasn't until, and I loved it. I mean, uh, we, we all played Mississippi queen. That was, that was, um, you know, a prerequisite for bar bands in the, in the early nineties, but, but seeing Rick do it in, in, in person, it was like, okay, that's what I want. I want one of those guitars, especially in that room at Smith's man, because it's not a big room. No. And, uh, and to have to have on that stage to have a half stack, pushing that much air in that small space had to have been a, uh, <laughs> as you're describing a bit of a religious experience, I, I probably would have had the same conclusion as you did, you know? It was, and I missed those days. I was just talking to, I was talking to Isabel the other day about people who push air and, you know, that's kind of a lost art because sound men hate you now and they don't, you don't have to. And a lot of people are using, you know, uh, modeling devices. And, and, uh, he said that Ry Cooter came and, sat in with the 400 unit at the Ryman. And I said, what did he play through? And he said, a super reverb, uh, basically dimed. And I said, oh my God. He goes, that's how you sit in, man. (laughs) You fill the room up with sound. And he goes, you know, that's the old guys. Like he said, it wasn't, it wasn't annoyingly loud. He was, he was filling up the room with music. Right. And that's like those, those old amps, man. They don't, they get loud, but and I didn't understand this until I started actually having the opportunity to play big amps. It's like they get louder, but at a certain point they stop getting louder and the compression starts to take over. And, and that it's like that sweet spot that everyone talks about where it's like, yeah, it's loud, but it's not peeling paint and, and it's moving air. And there's this thing that happens with big amps that I call it the thud. It's like, that initial pick of like the transient of the note where the, the speakers react and you can literally feel like the concussion in your chest and in the guitar, it's, it's a special thing. Um, yes. and yeah, I, I fear that you're right. Those, those days, those days are kind of behind us. I can't, you know, back before 2020, um, one of the, the last tours I was able to go on, I, I had a, a tweed deluxe clone and I actually played at Smith's. I believe yeah. with that amp and 
was told basically I had that amp running as quiet as it would go and still was like, Hey, can you bring the stage volume down a little bit? You're really fighting with it. And it's like, man, <laughs> so Stop. we're kind of forced into doing like the modeler stuff and the, you know, the plexiglass shields and the smaller amps now, because people like singers and front of house guys, they don't want any volume coming from the stage whatsoever, you know? It's crazy. I mean, I understand, especially, you know, like our, I love our front of house guy, John Farrell. And I'm like, I get it, man. You want it to sound good. And I play two amps um, uh, on stage and um, a plexi half stack and then a like a brown fender half stack. And it's loud. And so we use not plexiglass, but we use some baffles, mm -hmm. some decorative baffles in front of the cabinets now, just about a foot and a half away. And that way I can still, it's still filling up the room. It's just not killing and it's not knocking the front row. The, yeah. The laser beam drilling straight into people's faces. Yeah. Right. Um, <laughs> but I don't think that I could ever just completely kill the stage volume because there goes the energy for me. I'm just speaking for myself. And um, I just remember going to see, like I, I remember seeing the black crows at the, the greater Atlanta pot festival in 1992 and uh, it was loud. I mean, they had walls of marshals. It was that beautiful rock and right. roll thing. That can't be uh, replicated with plexiglass. Yeah, you're right. And there's an important thing that even if you're playing a modeler or something like that, um, which I think are great tools, and, and I use them all the time, but yeah. you, you really need to have something on stage pushing the air because – you, uh, I, I talked to, um, an amp builder friend of mine about this a while ago. There's, there's a interaction that happens between the speaker and the pickup that uh -huh. needs to be there in order for the guitar to sound right. Yeah. And I think with, with players now, um, it, it, you, you see it in like mega churches and all stuff where everyone wants all the amps and everything off the stage, go direct, no speakers, no nothing. You're, you're losing half of the sound of the rig almost and you're getting you're, you're trying to make a, a studio type sound work live which i don't i just i don't know it, it i can work but for what you're trying to do i yeah. i completely agree you got to have the stuff on stage you know david gilmore i read a quote not long ago he said he said when you've been playing the electric guitar on stage for a long time at at a volume at a level of volume that if you backed uh, if you fell toward it, it would hold you up. He goes, that's a tough drug to kick. <laughs> I, I get, I'm not nearly that loud, but I get, I get that. And I'm like, yeah. okay, that's why those old guys don't turn down because mm -hmm. they, they've always done that. You know, mm -hmm. they, they come from that school. I was just talking to my buddy Benji the other day. We we've been, well, after Eddie Van Halen died, we all were just dissecting Van Halen records and just going back and remembering how we, we were kids, how, impactful it all was and i got one of those uh, one of those frankenstrats and you know brought it home and i've never been able to play that way uh, but mm -hmm. it's a beautiful thing but but it kind of dawned on me i was like you know what huge volume was a big part of how he was able to do what he did as far as the sustain and the way his hands interacted with the guitar all yes. all that handsy stuff you can't do that at a low volume. It's got to be plexi in the room dimed. Yeah, it's almost like the amp was sort of acting as a as a compressor, it, evening out, you know, and I'm no Van Halen expert. I certainly can't play like that either. But from from the stuff I've listened to and watched of, of his over the years, it's like being able to, to tap and move on the fretboard as quickly as he did, you need some level of compression to even all that stuff out. The way he yeah. was doing it was just bringing those amps to their breaking point and bringing the, the, the power down, right. Browning them out with a right. variac and things like that. Yeah. Um, which I don't know if you've ever tried that. It, uh, it, it totally changes the feel yeah. of the amp. I, I understand that it only works like what he did, like bringing with the variac, bringing the voltage down to like, like 89, but he also had that head biased to run at that low voltage. Mm-hmm. So I, I understand, I've never done it, but I understand that it only really works if you have that head or heads uh, rebiased and, and biased to run that low voltage. And there's a lot of lore about the brown sound that, 
you know, I'm, I'm getting out of my area of experience and expertise here talking about it. So I, I tread lightly with this stuff, but yeah, I've, I've also heard that his amps were UK models. So they were, they were wired for 220, um, or 240, 220. I can't remember. Yeah. And, um, that also had a massive, massive effect, but you're right. It's the, the, the overall theme here is you turn the amp up and you get a, you get a sound, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, he also, you know, made that first record, maybe the, maybe the first two records basically with, I, he said it about the first record. He said, well, I made that record with one, uh, hundred watt Marshall super lead plexi head, a four twelve, and two guitars and one fifty seven. <laughs> and, I, and I think, you know what I do when we go in the studio, I go get every guitar on <laughs> about eight different amps. <laughs> <laughs> oh man well that actually brings up a really a, a cool topic i want to talk to you about too which is the recording process for you you know what what does it look like um kind of going back to the writing thing a little bit do you go into the studio fully prepared like we're going to track whatever 10 15 songs uh, we've got them demoed out we're ready to go in and knock it out or is it more of a we're going into the studio we're going to try and get inspired there and see what comes out well, we've always gone in prepared and, uh, that's just simply because studio time's expensive and we've never had the money to waste. Um, and it feels good to be prepared, you know, mm. but we've always understood like I'll, I'll, especially, you know, when, when I first started to use garage band and then logic, excuse me. Um, I started to make more and more elaborate demos. Um, I remember the first time I sent, Cause, cause initially, you know, I would just record myself playing the acoustic guitar and some, and some percussion and vocals. And then like with garage band, with those drummers, with the drum tracks. And I, I remember the first one that I sent to Brit and he's like, who's that playing the drums? <laughs> I said, Oh, his name's uh, Terry or something. <laughs> he's, a, he's a rock dude. He's one of the three rock dudes, but I started to like, well, I think I know what, how I would like the bass to be approached or the second guitar or whatever, you know, but I never was like, Hey, learn this like a cover song. You know, mm -hmm. it was just a, a it was fun for me to make these demos, but I wanted, you know, people to understand it was a good arrangement tool as well to be like, Hey, I think this arrangement works, but we always understood it. When we go in the studio, um, let's keep our minds open and, whatever changes need to be made on the fly, you know, cause you know how it is. You can go and you'd be like, I hear this in my head and it goes like this and you try it with four other people and you go, no, nope, that's not the way it should go. Mm -hmm. And then on the fly, you have to adapt and be like, Hey, you know what? Let's make it a waltz. So, so demo itis is not something that you would say you deal with a lot where you're kind of married to the original demo that you made. You're free to just kind of make it whatever it needs to be in the studio. Yeah. I tried not to be, if when you, it's easy to get demo itis if you really like your demo, you know, um, and certain songs, it's just like, Hey, it kind of has to go this way. I mean, it's kind of, you know what I mean? Like yeah. some songs are born really like they come out of the ground, like a potato. It's like, that's it right there. Um, but then other times like this newest record that we made, um, two songs I was writing while we were there. Um, and we, uh, Dave Cobb produced our, our newest one. That's it'll probably be released in the spring sometime, but those, he heard the two little ideas and was like, you got to finish those, um, and add them to these that we're already recording and that mm -hmm. you guys are prepared for. So it was kind of like, Oh, well, we've not done this in a long time. Just, to, yep. and so it was like, all right, it goes like this and it was great. And everybody played their asses off and it, they turned out to be my two favorite songs on the record. So I'm glad you brought up Dave Cobb because I wanted to ask about about that. He's he's one of my favorite producers, um, just period. Yeah. Uh, every everything he puts his hands on, I end up loving. Um, the High Women record last year, unbelievable. You know, um, the Rival Sons stuff. I'm a huge fan of. Did you know Dave uh, back when he was here? I back in the day, I didn't know him. I saw his band a bunch, the Tender Idols. Yeah, on play at Smiths, and um, I had friends. Well, I had a, a couple of friends that were really friendly with him, but I never met him. Uh, I met him on the phone um, five years ago. Nice. Nice. So, yeah, it kind of brings up, going back to the Atlanta thing, it's like 
and this was all before my time. So I'm, I'm interested in talking to guys like you about, and uh, cause one of my good friends is uh, Rick Beato, who's been yeah. here and producing records for years and years. And, you know, when I hear like him and, and Dave on and, and Tim Smith and, and all these like old school Atlanta guys talk about Atlanta back in the nineties through the early two thousands, it seemed like if you were a rock band or musician or guitarist, like Atlanta was one of the, probably premier places to be for that kind of stuff right i think so um for a minute and then it kind of got weird um like in the mm, a few years into the 2000s i think atlanta for me anyway sort of lost some identity as far mm. as rock and roll goes it felt that way anyway um maybe it's because we couldn't sell a ticket <laughs> but like we had to go to michigan to sell tickets but weird and it seemed like a lot of the rock and roll bands started to break up then. Um, yeah. And I could be, that just, just my perspective, you know? I don't think so. I mean, from what I know, I was a kid then, but it's like, yeah, the early 2000s hit, new metal was big at the time, but a lot of the bands that, you know, the late 80s through the 90s rock bands, specifically Southern rock bands, it's like, yeah, nobody really, well, not nobody, but a lot of people kind of didn't really make it through that transition. And then, you know, hip hop and, and all that stuff sort of took over as the premier, you know, commercial success, uh, commercially viable form of music, which it has stayed that way. And, but it seems yeah. to me that like, you look at this pendulum that sort of swings every 25 to 30 years, musically and artistically, and just culturally. And it seems to me that we might be coming back into that pendulum might start swinging back into rock and, and blues and Americana's favor, not to where it becomes another top 40 sensation. I don't think it'll ever be back in that spotlight. And I kind of hope it doesn't for several reasons, but um, I'm asking you all this because my wife and I decided to stay in Atlanta versus moving to Nashville. And part of the reason we decided was I love this city. I grew up outside of Atlanta, but around here. And I do believe that this place could see a sort of renaissance in terms of the the music scene someday soon. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. But. Yeah, I wouldn't disagree with that uh, just because it's just so uh, those shifts that you speak of are so unpredictable. You know, um, I do know that like my oldest son is 23 and uh, the, our other guitar player, Paul's uh, his oldest son, I think is 17 and they both, eat, sleep and breathe rock and roll guitar. So, and it's, and it really is not because we did or do. Um, they found it. I don't think either one of us pushed it on them. They just found it. Um, mm. And as long as there are people finding it, you know, people like, like I think George Grun maybe a couple of years ago was like, Oh, the guitar is dead. I'm like it. No, it never will. It's just, it's too, it's too accessible and too important. And as, yeah. as there's a, as long as there are kids that have a little bit more patience than maybe their buddy, they're going to pick it up and learn how to play Stairway to Heaven. It's inevitable. You know? it, it, has it always kind of been that way? I mean, I, I've, I've seen the same articles and stuff of people lamenting, oh, death of the guitar, no more guitar solos and stuff. But I feel like, you know, pop, guitar was only a, a, a centralized thing and, and, pop culture for a pretty limited amount of time on the you know grand scheme of things and it seems to have always been kind of this sort of thing that people always find and gravitate to no matter what's popular at the time you know i my wife and i talked about it the other day um and this touches on that when eddie van halen passed um it was a sh i mean and i'm not i'm not trying to overstate the importance of of uh his life or his music but it was a shockwave uh, throughout all of pop culture for a second. It was like, wait a minute, whether or not I really thought about it, this dude and his guitar made a huge impact on culture. Yeah. Um, and it transcended just, just like Van Halen fans from the first two records, like him playing on the beat it uh, or him playing the beat it solo rather on the beat it. What am I saying? <laughs> <laughs> He played on, yeah, uh, but, <laughs> and then the MTV generation, my, my, you know, people my age that saw him on television with that striped guitar every day, right. literally every 
freaking day. And those songs, I mean, they were great. They, they wrote great songs, period. That's right. Alice Cooper the other day when, when Eddie died, he, he was talking about uh, Eddie's innovation with the electric guitar and how there have been people that were game changers, you know, down through the years, obviously Hendrickson and well, he, well, he, he was like, I mean, the two most important guys, as far as rock and roll, electric guitar, Hendrix and Eddie Van Halen, they're the two guys that completely changed the way that you use it. Right. And it resonated with everyone, whether or not you could do it, you heard it and were like, Oh shit, what <laughs> is that? You know? Um, but anyway, his point too was like, here's, here's how he's different than like, Alan Holdsworth or even Jeff Beck. He was doing all this crazy innovative stuff in the middle of a huge hit song. <laughs> yes. That right. everybody wanted to sing along to. So um, anyway, I, I'm my long winded uh, answer is look what the guitar can do. You know, it's, it still can. And it just show, goes to show you that when, when Eddie passed away, bless him, it wasn't just like, ah, too bad. Right. Right. It was all over. Everything. So yeah, it seems it's an to impactful. me, uh, you're, you're totally, you're totally right. And I think there's this thing with just musicianship in general, where no matter, in my opinion, no matter what seems to happen in po- terms of pop culture, top 40 culture, it's like people will always eventually get back to somebody somewhere playing an instrument and singing a song like it's it's all about the song yeah i mean beat it's a great example of that fantastic song right um and so i just i completely and wholeheartedly disagree with that that take of a few years ago of like oh the guitar's dead and kids don't care about it especially after 2020 2020 was the biggest guitar sales year on record and there's more women getting into guitar and girls getting into guitar than ever before which is amazing and yeah like it's um now because of the internet and, and Instagram and YouTube, like it's easier than ever to go back and watch a Magic Sam video or a Van Halen video. Some kid that's like twelve or thirteen now can kind of find that spark and then go deep dive on this stuff and get like a real education. Yeah. First hand education of watching and listening to these people that wasn't possible before. No. I you know, my funny you should mention that my my oldest son um he he was late to get interested in guitar he when he was about 17 he found and i'd given him one but he's like eh, i'm gonna go ride my skateboard you know right and then all of a sudden one day i don't know what it was but it was like okay he and i could tell i'm like oh he's he he's got it mm-hmm. he, he's been bitten now you know and uh and he went in you know head first and all in just like i did when i was you know, 11. Right. And, you know, then I had to, you know, you learn from people. We either, you learn, you know, you listen and I learned by ear, but then I had, there were certain things where like, how is that? How is he doing that? And then a buddy of mine would be like, it's like this. I'm like, Oh, that's how you do it. Well, my son comes in one day and starts to play bark at the moon correctly. Like the solo licks. And I'm like, how did you learn that? <laughs> it's like, oh, on YouTube. And I'm like, oh, well, lessons are at your fingertips now. Where, right. Um, I mean, I sound like an old man, but it's true. <laughs> it's like so much more accessible. Like I want to, and I use it, you know, sometimes mm-hmm. if I'm like, cause I, I fancy myself learning how to play jazz guitar every, every year. I love it. And I, it's mm. not, it's not, it doesn't live in me like rock and roll does, but I can, you know, click on a, on a West Montgomery video and try and try oh, to figure it out. I, I love West Montgomery so much. I'm the same way. I don't, I don't have the jazz sort of language. Exactly. I love it, but I don't, I don't speak that no, language. Me neither. The theory escapes me. I just, I want to grasp it and I, yeah. and I don't yet, but I'll I, just I, flat I a just, note another time and call myself. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just, just play something chromatic real quick and call that jazz. Yeah. Uh, I think it's one of those things that you, maybe this is too broad of a statement to make, but in my feeling is that you really need to be exposed to it. It is like a language in order to speak it culturally. I think you need to be exposed to it early and often. And I wasn't exposed to it until I was like 21 in music school at AIM. And at that point, I think that sort of ship had sailed for me, you know, 
being able to play it. But yeah, I mean, the YouTube thing's important, man. You know, there's, and not just the lesson front, just the fact that you can literally go just type in and find a video of almost any performance of any person in history. If it was filmed, it's probably on YouTube and you can find it. And just, just watching, you know, Robin Ford play, you know, Montreux Jazz Festival and, you know, 87 or 88, whenever it was, and just like watching his, the way he approaches it, it's like, oh, cool. Now I can, I can put a visual context to what he's doing to what I'm listening to. And that's, that's it, man. If you can start to do that, you're off to the races. That's right. That's exactly it. That's a, 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 so, so many aspects to that. Like, oh, if I'd known, okay, look at that. I see now he's an open G, you know, I can tell by the chord shapes. Like if I had known that, wow, that would have saved me three months. <laughs> All right, so I want to hear this story that you referenced um, earlier in the interview, this uh, the show story. Oh, okay. So initially, last year when uh, you know we were in we were in uh, Canada, we were on a Canadian tour uh, in March when the hammer fell, and and uh, and and uh, we were we were told get back home. Cause you know, you never know what's going to happen. Borders might right. get shut down all that. So we, we come home and we didn't leave just like everybody else. It was like, poof, locked down. And so as things started to open up a little, people started to, you know, peer out into the daylight and obviously shows were a very important idea for all of us. That's our living, you know? And so we were offered a couple of drive-in shows and that was a pretty new thing. I think the first one actually happened in Belgium unless I'm, unless I'm absolutely mistaken, Mm. but, uh, there were two that were offered and they were, I think in Texas and, uh, it was like weird. Okay. Well, and, and I was told, okay, there are some changes in production and the way that the show will be put on. And I said, what is, well, what's that? And they said, well, there won't actually be PA. The front of house mix will be sent to a radio frequency which is like old school old like okay school everybody get in your theater. car turn your, turn your radio to 88.1 and that's where yeah. you'll get the audio and i said that sounds horrible <laughs> so uh, and the guys in the band were all like what you know because i mean we all know nothing nothing sucks worse than when the when the front of house is turned off and oh, you're yeah. playing at a show it's like a tinker toy <laughs> so I had a buddy in a band who I saw that they had done two of those shows. And I texted him and said, how was that? And he said, sucked. It absolutely <laughs> sucked. You know, as far as a, the fun factor goes, that, right. that's different from the make a living factor. Sure. But at that point, you know, there were some other reasons too, like even like how much it cost us to go do a show. Our overhead hasn't changed during COVID. Uh, mm-hmm. Some of, what you might get guaranteed to do a show has changed. Mm. So it was easy to go, Hey, if we go do this, we're going to lose 200 bucks, <laughs> you mm-hmm. know, mm-hmm. Uh, or make $5 each. So, Hey, you know right. what, instead of driving, let's stay here. And it was just, a, that was a crazy time. So that, that, you know, as time goes on, uh, full production outdoor shows started to happen and we did uh, a bunch of those and it was great. Right. Except for one. We were on our way to Cape Cod, Massachusetts. And, uh, you know, a lot of the promoters that you have to deal with early on, uh, you know, like Live Nation was basically shut down. We started dealing with promoters and I would hear from management. It's like, oh, this is the dude way back from 1998 that we said we never would answer his phone call again. (laughs) So it's a lot of crazy stuff like that happens. I won't throw anybody specifically on it. Sure. But there's a lot of shysters that started coming out of the woodwork to make a dollar, you know. Right. So you show up and the stage is not a stage, you know, it's like 55 gallon drums with four by fours laid across it. Anyway, we get to this one show and I will throw Cape Cod, Massachusetts, that particular venue under the bus because we weren't told until we basically rolled up that, oh, by the way, this is going to be one of those. There's no front, there's no line array. There's no front of house. Um, and we would have said no, you know, right. but when you get to the gig, we we come from the school of you play. Yeah. You're here, you play. You don't, yeah. you don't leave, you don't quit. So we played and I, I looked out and, and we decided to play an acoustic show because we thought, well, if it's not going to be impactful, we might as we might as well make it as, 
uh, as quiet as we possibly can, <laughs> you know, so it won't be so strange to be. Right. And I looked out at people when we started and we we're in ears now, you know, mm-hmm. I've been for years. So it really wasn't all that different for me playing an acoustic show with no PA with in ears in. Right. But I look out and all the people are standing beside their cars and we start to play. And obviously all they can hear is a set of drums. That's all. Right. And they're going. <laughs> and, and so the reason why I said I would throw that particular promoter under the bus is because they didn't let anybody know. So I about thought, the you, radio you, thing or just the, the, you guys not knowing it was going to be a PA list show. Letting them know that it would be the radio thing. Hey, by the way, it's not going to be the same thing as going to an outdoor show. I thought that's so unfair. I mean, and those are some pretty understanding people that they didn't demand a refund. Yeah. They- well, because then that puts you in the worst position because you're the guy on stage and the people don't know. Yeah. We the look audience- like yeah. yeah, exactly. The audience doesn't know, well, this is actually the promoter's fault. And they didn't, it's, they just see you on stage, not working. And right. you know, well, what the hell I paid to be here. Where's the sound at the same time. I was told later, cause I was furious. It's like, wow, we're not, we are not in the business of ripping people off. This sucks, right. you know? Right. And the, the people were very nice and I tried to smooth it over as, as well as I could. I mean, I had no, there's not really much I could say other than, Hey, we didn't want to leave you right, and not play for you. But unfortunately this is the setup of the, of the day. But I found out later, it's like the reason why this is happening is because all the neighbors have been complaining about the noise when they did have actual PA and that made me even madder. I'm like, whose neighbors suck so much? And it's like, okay, we've all been locked down for 10 months. Right. We'll get loud. <laughs> we can't have that. Oh. Uh, it's like it's like Chastain, you know, there are certain shows I've learned. Uh, I saw Government Mule at Chastain, and I just uh-huh. learned, mm, I love Government Mule, but that's not the venue. That is not just, Government Mule's venue. No. No, it's oh. not. I saw <laughs> for those there here- with Dr. John. That was yeah yeah I was there that was the show I was there yeah and uh, it was it was so underwhelming because you can't for those of you who don't know Chastain is a beautiful amphitheater in like kind of uh, just it's in Atlanta sort of but it's in a very like residential area and they have a strict um, SPL limit yeah. and they have a strict curfew and they don't go and so yeah for a band like Government Mule like I wanted to hear Warren Haynes yeah. play and ADB that's the limit yeah eighty dB that's really it eighty eight. Which is, not, which is not much more. Oh my God. What is that? Yeah. Is that a snare drum basically? <sighs> well, yeah. I mean, if it's a good rim shot, I think a snare drum might be even a little bit more than that. Yeah. It's, you know? it's on an average I'm told. So, but right. it, still it's like, no, that's not, that's, oh my God. that's no fun. That's, that was the last show at Chastain I've been to was that show. And that was what, six years ago, something like that. Yeah, totally. <sighs> man well charlie this has been uh this has been great dude thank you so much for coming on you want to you want to plug the new record you guys have a release date for it yet we don't i can't plug yet um, okay but we'll it'll they'll there will be an announcement coming soon okay when everything full disclosure this episode is probably going to go out sometime late february early march so i don't know if you have something then but what i can do is if you do have it i'll put it retroactively in the video and in the show notes oh fantastic yeah, yeah. Well, dude, thank you so much, man. Um, thank you, man. This won't be the last time we uh, we do something together here, so I yeah. appreciate it, dude. You will have to come back to the house, and we'll we'll pick some more sometime. Oh yeah, I I, I still think about your Gibson. Was it a forty one L double O? That's it. it yeah, dude, man. That guitar is one of it's one of those guitars that like left an impression on me. You know what I'm talking yeah. about? Me too. Like, That's why I had to have it. I, uh, it's so loud and. So- <sighs> And so present, I'm like, that's a perfect example of that guitar has been a guitar for so long. Yep. You just can't replicate that. There is nothing, nothing that will do that for a guitar other than time. Time. That's That's it. (laughs) Awesome. So there you go. Hope you enjoyed that interview with Charlie. Um, Like I said, I'll have his links to everything in the description box down below or in the show notes of this episode if you're listening to the podcast. Um, If you've never listened to Blackberry Smoke, you absolutely should. They are just really, really doing the the Southern rock sound justice today. Uh, And I cannot wait to hear that new record that they did with Dave Cobb. 
Dave Cobb is one of those people, like I said, with Charlie. Anything he puts his hands on, I'm I'm a fan of. Um, I would love to be able to work with Dave Cobb one day. That's kind of a bucket list item for me. So slightly jealous that Charlie and the guys got to do a record with Dave. Anyways, um, yeah, be sure to check that out. And if you are uh, watching the show on YouTube, be sure to subscribe to uh, my second channel here, Red Shell Studio, and check out the playlist. We've got previous episodes uh, of the show linked back below. Um, and if you're listening to the podcast, be sure to subscribe and leave a kind uh, review and rating on iTunes. Helps new people find the show. So thank you guys so much for watching and for listening. My name is Rhett Shull, and uh, remember, there is no plan B. I don't normally sign the podcast off that way, but I think I should. It's kind of a general brand thing. Anyways, see you guys next week.